All right, welcome to community ecology. So now we're getting a little bit broader. Before we were talking about population ecology and that was just one species and it was a subgroup of a species. Now we're talking about a whole bunch of species living together. That's what makes up a community. So um, when we look at communities and we're trying to diagnose their health, there's going to be two things that we're going to look at. Species richness and abundance. So abundance is going to be the total number of organisms that you find. So let's say we find 86,000 fish, right? That's going to be the abundance. Species richness is how many different species of those 86,000 we have, right? So um, if we get a relative abundance of 86,000 fish and a species richness of two, that's pretty scary, right? That means there's not a lot of biodiversity. Well, why do we care? Well, biodiversity, as you know, is important because the more different species we have out there, the less likely it is that something could just wipe everybody out, right? So species richness is going to be the amount of different species. Abundance is just the total amount of organisms in that community. Okay, so let's talk about interspecific interactions. This is going to be different things like competition, predation, parasitism, all sorts of things. These last two, mutualism and commensalism, you may not have heard of before, but don't worry, we are going to define that later in this chapter. And I love this chapter. I love it. It's super awesome. Okay. So interspecific competition, that's going to happen anytime resources are in short supply, right? So um, let's say that there's 36 people in a room and I get one pizza. Um, people are going to start grabbing for the pizza, especially if everybody's hungry because they know they may not get some, right? So all of a sudden they started to compete, right? Um, so that's going to be when you have competition happen. Okay, so we've got something called the ex competitive exclusion principle. And this is saying if you have two species that are competing for the same resource, one of those species has to go. Whether they die out or whether they move somewhere else or whether they change their niche, they cannot coexist with that other species, right? It's not like one species is going to say, hey, you get that stuff today and I'll get it tomorrow, right? Doesn't happen in nature, right? Okay, well, I'm sure there's some weird thing, but in general. Okay, so the ecological niche is going to be what a species needs every day. What amount of sunlight does it need? How much water does it need? Where does it need to live? What does it eat? What eats it? What role does it play in the food web? All of that type of stuff. Um, the niche is technically just its role in the environment. That's pretty much it, right? Okay, so if we wanted to use the word niche, we could actually say, and you can call it a niche too, um, you could say the competitive exclusion principle can be restated to say, if they have an identical niche, they can't coexist, right? Okay, so one thing that can happen as a result of competition is something called resource partitioning. And that's going to be where they differentiate their niches so they still can coexist in a community. So um, I have an example in my PowerPoint here of these barnacles. So barnacles, you know, you see those like growing on like docks and things like that. And they like to grow between high tide and low tide. So you can see there's these two species here. And what's happened is they've actually differentiated. And this species has said, you know what, I'll go to the high part of the high tide mark. And you can go to the low part of the low tide mark. And we can coexist, right? So they've changed their niche a little bit so that they don't have to go anywhere or get extinct as a result of it, right? So that's going to be resource partici partitioning. Um, another thing that can happen as a result of this competition is character displacement. And that's going to be where you have characteristics that are going to be more different in species that are living in the same place than in populations where they've been ge like geographically separated, right? So let's say you have the same two species that are in a lake together, they're going to have more pressure to be more different from one another than those two species if there's something separating them because they're not actually interacting with each other and actually pressuring each other. So that's going to be what character displacement is. Okay, so let's get into all the interactions that can happen within a community because there's tons. So we just talked about competition. Now we're talking about predation. And hopefully, if I ask this on your exam, you can get this right, that a predator eats prey. Hey yo. All right. So there's a lot of versions of predation. Herbivores are actually considered to be a predator because animals are eating plants and a plant is another living thing, right? And actually there's some cool studies out right now that are saying that um, plants can actually like sense pain and all sorts of different things. So all you vegetarians out there, 
think about that. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, and then parasites can also be considered to be predators because sometimes the parasite actually kills the, pre the prey or the host, I should say, right? So that would be an example too. So um, in order to be an awesome predator, they have to have adaptations to help them do that, right? So there's a lot of adaptations they can have. Um, they can have huge claws, they can have sharp teeth, they can have fangs that can deliver toxins, they can have toxins, they can have heat sensing organism, uh, organs, um, all sorts of different things to help them to do that. Um, then there is obviously going to be the other side of this and that's going to be the prey defense mechanisms. So in the next video we'll talk about that.